Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. There was a story in October, so we're just going to bring it back a little bit. And there was a journalist in Missouri who had reported that he was on the Missouri State's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And while he was on the site, he was checking out the source code. And to check out the source code, you can just right click on a web page and say view source code, or you can just hit F12 and that'll bring up the source code anytime you're on a site and you can take a look. There was something that was misconfigured in the source code and it was exposing over 100,000 of the teacher's social security numbers. So this journalist, Josh Renaud, did the right thing and reported it responsibly to the state. And then they waited, because he was a journalist with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The Post-Dispatch waited until the misconfiguration was fixed before they reported it in their paper. So he did everything right. He found a misconfiguration. He responsibly disclosed it. And then he waited until they fixed it before he disclosed it to the public. However, the Missouri's governor, Mike Parson, described the journalist who uncovered the vulnerability as a quote-unquote hacker and that the newspaper uncovered a flaw in an attempt to embarrass the state. And he referred a criminal complaint to the county prosecutors. Of course, this spawned a bunch of outrage from InfoSec Twitter, we're a bunch of sensitive people, and anytime something happens that outrages us, we have our pitchforks out. And so there was a lot of outrage, and it even spawned the hashtag F12 and find out for a while. If you know what that means, you know. But, you know, it, it comes to uh, the point of hacking is not necessarily a crime, and ethical hacking on top of that and responsibly disclosing things is certainly not a crime. I know that Adam and I have talked about how bug bounties can actually increase your security posture. So I think the main point of this story, and then there's a continuation, but the main point of this story to me, which struck home was there are a lot of people who are trying to do good out there and we oftentimes call them hackers. But you also re- refer to cyber criminals sometimes as hackers. So generally in the public or in the news, people just call them hackers. But hackers is a term that I would say is someone who may be doing ethical hacking or playing around with code or doing things like that where they're trying to do good. Cyber criminals is the term that I would use to talk about people who are breaking the law and doing things outside of the law. And so I think those terms are important to keep in mind when we're talking about different breaches and and things in the news, and especially when we're giving briefings in front of our coworkers or for different uh, C-suite members. So use the right terms. The continuation of the story is basically that the governor is doubling down on his original statement and the journalist is most likely to be charged. At recording time today, there's no criminal complaint that has been delivered, but he's awaiting. And the governor even had a statement where he said, if someone picks the lock on your house for whatever reason, regardless of if it's not a good lock or it's a cheap lock or a problem that you might have, they don't have the right to go into your house and take anything that belongs to you. While that is true, a better analogy for this, because 
were just viewing the source code. There was no network penetration. There was no illegal um, illegal hacking of, of any sort or laws broken, so to speak. Better analogy would be if you're walking past your neighbor's house and they had their door wide open and you could see all their valuables inside and you called them up and said, hey, your door's open. That's it. You're just disclosing something that you saw. So, again, I just wanted to spawn some conversation around how we refer to hacking and cyber criminals and the terminologies that we use and then, you know, talk about as defenders if someone were to report something to you, you know, don't take offense to that. A lot of times you may say, oh, hey, why are you looking at my network? You shouldn't be doing that. But instead, you should have the attitude of appreciation. Thanks for taking a look at this, especially if they have good intent, right? If they have good intent. You have bug bounty. Maybe you don't have bug bounty. But if someone finds something, try to assume good intent and then, you know, go from there. So. I have a, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a number of thoughts on this and I am a big member of team words matter. I have tried to modify my language over time to use more inclusive phrases. I think Andy, you talked about black list and white list and instead using things like allow list or block list. That's just better. Or as opposed to white glove Try to find another phrase to describe it like pre-provisioning or whatever the case may be in the context you're using it in. So I'm a big proponent of that. I think the word hacker is honestly beyond salvation at this point, and we should just avoid using the term because it is a loaded term in, in mainstream conversation, and it's not well understood that it does not necessarily ascribe criminal intent but it's been used that way for so long, it might not be something we can save. So instead, cyber criminal is a good word for somebody who has malicious intent, somebody who is doing security research. We can call them a security researcher. I think ultimately, I just don't like the word because it is too much of a loaded meaning and it's misunderstood. And it's supposed to trying to constantly educate or say, oh no, that's not what it means. Maybe we just don't use it. And that's coming from somebody who is a, certified ethical hacker and has that uh, certification from EC Council. I don't even really like it much anymore. I wish it described something else. Um, on a couple other notes here, and again, we, we try to avoid going political on this show, and I'm, I'm not going to go into that a whole heck of a lot here, but as somebody who has been at one point in time a registered member of both major political parties in the United States, I will say traditionally conservative Republican politics aligned to concepts like limited government and responsible use of fiscal resources. And this is not that we had a very similar incident here in the Des Moines Metro area where a retiring County prosecutor prosecuted a journalist who had been covering some of the BLM uh, activities and was pepper sprayed by the police and detained and attempted to bring charges against her. Uh, she, she was a reporter for the Des Moines Register and still is um, for not properly dispersing or following police orders or whatever. And it went all the way to trial. And so there was a trial. There was resources used from, you know, the attorney's office and the DA's office and uh, court costs and everything else. Lots of costs involved with attempting to prosecute this woman. And the moment it went to the jury, it was returned immediately not guilty. Um, because she had disclosed herself as a journalist, had you know covered it from a safe location and everything else. And it has kind of been part of this, I don't want to use a loaded phrase like a war on journalism, but kind of the uh, ascribing malicious intent to journalists and trying to stick it to them, which has ultimately become a waste of government resources, which is runs counter to uh, what conservative politics have traditionally you know meant. And, and this is another disappointing case in that where ultimately, if this does go to trial, it would be unbelievable for it to turn out any verdict other than not guilty once the details are made public, right? You can explain the technical details to this to even a lay person that literally every single time somebody loaded that page, all of the social security numbers were being transmitted to every computer that accessed it. 
They were loaded in memory. They were processed through the CPU. They were stored in RAM. They just weren't displayed on screen. And when you understand that conversation that the state had configured this in a way that they were transmitting the social security numbers to every single reader of the page, that is clearly not any sort of uh, computer fraud or uh, breaking and entering from an electronic sense or anything else, right? There, there aren't any charges that would stick here. So if this does lead to a criminal complaint, lead to a trial, that's a waste of government resources. And whether you hate journalists or not, which you shouldn't, but it's another conversation for another time, you should hate the misuse and wastefulness of government resources to prove a political point. And that's ultimately what this is. So um, just a real shame here. Responsible disclosure is always the right thing to do. Um, I hope this doesn't act, act as a chilling effect on people wanting to properly disclose, especially to the state where this could have wound up being a much bigger security breach and ultimately led to more serious consequences uh, down the road and have greater costs to clean up. Like having this disclosed properly could have saved the state of Missouri money. And so that's another concern too, is why are you attempting to, uh, Oh gosh, I'm not sure what the word is, but essentially cast malicious intent on somebody that potentially saved you money and potentially saved you embarrassment and potentially saved you worse consequences as a result. It's just a shame all the way around. And, you know, the governor using the word hacker just proves like we shouldn't try to save that word. We should try to move on from it. You know, we are, we're security researchers. We are um, anything else, security defenders, as opposed to that phrase, just because I think we can't save it from the general public. I think having a responsible disclosure pathway or a bug bounty program in your organization, whether you have to pay the person who discloses it, maybe you don't, but you know, larger companies are going to have a, an actual bug bounty program, but just a method of submitting something Right, you should have probably the email address of security at org dot com or infosec at org dot com or information security at org dot com, just to cover your bases. Because if I was some person who was out there and I'm just browsing your site or using your app and I find something, people are technically savvy these days. There are a ton of resources out there. People are educating themselves. If they find something a good person's going to want to try to report it and you want to make it as easy as possible and as painless as possible. We certainly don't want to discourage anyone from responsibly disclosing a vulnerability that we might have as a company. So that's my soapbox. Mm -hmm. That story reminded me of one, uh, I think it was a year ago, maybe in 2020 or even in 2019 where there were two pen testers and Adam, you said that this was in your neck of the woods that were arrested for doing a physical pen test. So they were contracted by the county to do a physical pen test of their network uh, as well as of their buildings. And they were arrested by the sheriff's department when they were outside the courthouse picking the lock to get into the building. They showed that they had authorization with the statement of work, they called and the courthouse verified that they had authorizations, but the officers still were arrested and they were charged with burglary, which is a felony. That's not something that is, you know, a, like a misdemeanor or just a, a little traffic ticket. I mean, it's a felony charge. So that's a pretty serious thing to be charged with. And, Eventually, the charges were dropped, but, you know, think about that pen tester who was doing their job. They were arrested. They went to jail. They had to post bail, which cost money. They had their pictures and names in the paper and their reputation with their company and across the United States and, and possibly the world were ruined. And so there was a, a cost to them personally for charges that were bogus essentially. And so again, that more comes to, you know, pen testing being a little bit more 
dangerous in planning. I think even in the sense of if your company and you're trying to do a pen test or having a pen test done, it may be prudent to notify some folks that something is happening, even if you don't want it to be a surprise. You don't want it to you don't want the pen the your company to have any information that a pen test is going on. Talking to those guys later on, they're actually changing their method and their rules of engagement where they are notifying law enforcement anytime there's any type of physical pen test done. So if they're responding, they they have a heads up. So safety, I think, is is pretty important um, in both, you know, for defenders and for pen testers when you're when you're talking about this sort of thing. Yes. So this was in Dallas County, Iowa, which is the fastest growing county in the state of Iowa, because all of the western suburbs of the Des Moines metro are actually all in Dallas County, not in Polk County, where you know the the Des Moines area had originally kind of started in. And so the courthouse in Dallas County is in a not suburb, but a small town called Adel, which was actually the birthplace of Niall Kinnick, um, which the I, University of Iowa's football stadium is named after. Anyhow, Adel is still a small town. It's not a suburb. There, there's still actual some country roads between that and, and the nearest suburb, which is you know about 10 miles away. So all that is to say, very fast growing, but kind of this mix of suburban plus rural kind of community. And this was such an interesting story in that it reminded me to go on a tangent for a split second on the anniversary of nine 11 last year, Apple TV plus did a phenomenal documentary where they had gone back and, and pulled in all the major players from that at the time, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, uh, Andrew Card, a lot of the members of Bush's team, Condoleezza Rice, and did new interviews with them and recounted that day. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was when George W. Bush was on Air Force One, at one point he was demanding to go back to Washington, D.C., and they told him no. And he's like, what do you mean you're telling me no? I'm the commander in chief. Turn the flipping plane around, you know, was his uh, as he's recounting the story. And as it turns out, and and I don't even know all of the like legal mechanisms that make this work, but Air Force One is under the command of the Secret Service, and the Secret Service has an obligation to protect the president. Even when the president is giving them an order, they don't have to respond to him, apparently, if the president's life is in danger. Like if he tells them to do something that would endanger him, they can ignore it or not follow that order. And I'm not quite sure how that whole chain of command works because I know Air Force One is is run by the Air Force and there's an Air Force officer flying the aircraft. But anyhow, all that's to say, sometimes there's complexity to this. And part of the complexity that had come out around this, this physical test of the Dallas County Courthouse was the folks who had ordered this, uh, this physical security review penetration test did not have the complete authorization to give that permission um, because the county courthouse, and again, this gets into like legal mechanisms, and I don't remember the exact t- detail, but it was something like either the sheriff's office didn't have the authority to do that or somebody else who had ordered it, like the county courthouse security team didn't have permission or, or whatever the case may be. It's one of those things that, and these these pen testers learned after the fact you really need to dot your I's and cross your T's that somebody's saying, oh, yeah, you have permission to, you know, attempt to break into this building or do social engineering or whatever. Make sure they actually have the legal permission to authorize that, because in this case, they didn't all the way. And so the the county sheriff wasn't entirely wrong to take these guys uh, into custody there while they kind of sorted it out because there were some um some questionable decision making there, and the charges were dropped. And this was this was actually handled reasonably professionally, given all the complexity involved in it. But it still was a shame that it even got to that point. You know, there obviously we don't want to have any uh, experiences with with law enforcement in a negative way, where they think we're attempting to do something bad when we're actually attempting to help them with their physical security. So this was an interesting, complex case, and certainly it's worth reading up on if, if you ever have some curiosity into physical penetration testing gone wrong. Uh, Dallas County, Iowa is is where this happened. And 
you know, uh, we, we have a couple of links we'll put in the show notes from Ars Technica and uh, from ABC News that, that follow the story a little bit. So very interesting case for sure. Yeah, and Adam and I have often talked about the need for having more diverse teams. And thankfully, even though it's slow, I think, cybersecurity is getting more diverse. We're getting more women into the field. We're getting more minorities into the field. And, you know, early on, we talked about how we're changing our nomenclature. You know, like terms like black hat and white hat, you know, they may not necessarily have the intent of being racist, but that implied, you know, um, subtle meaning just maybe has a different place now with some of the changes that are happening within society. So, you know, maybe having cyber criminal or, or security researcher is a better term. There was an article that talked about how as a minority on a red team, that could be a dangerous thing. And that made me think about this Dallas County incident because in this case, both of the men who were arrested were white. And this happened late at night. It was like 1230 AM when they got arrested and they were picking the locks. But imagine if they were African American and they were security researchers, pen testing had a valid, um, you know, a valid authorization in this case, you know, they thought that they had a valid authorization. So, um, but you know, when the, when you talk to those guys who were arrested, it was a fairly civil arrest. There was no, there were no guns drawn. Everyone was fairly calm. There was, you know, exchange of paperwork, explaining some phone calls and, and getting, trying to get everything sorted out. But imagine if they were African American, I would bet that there would be guns drawn, people ordered to the ground, you know, it'd be a different, a different encounter and possibly even, you know, life threatening, I would argue, you know, in some cases, because, you know, just in, in the way that our, our society is, unfortunately. So I, I think, um, you know, until there's, there's, uh, some barriers that are removed, this is even something more to think about as we get more and more diverse that the onus is on, you know, both the person probably contracting the, the pen testing and, and thinking about all the things that could happen as well as of course the company that hires the pen testers and, and, you know, doing the pen testing itself, we should consider employee safety as number one, and think about those things going into it because that's not oftentimes something that you think about. And of course, we you know in the case of like physical pen testing where you're actually going on site and doing things like that versus like doing an audit, which you can do remotely, and there's really no danger in that. Not to say that you want to put someone on the back seat, but if they have the capabilities, you can maybe shift the responsibilities around to prioritize em- employee safety. So I think. That was an interesting article that I read, and I do hope that more and more people are getting into cybersecurity who are diverse, and I hope that they aren't discouraged by some of the events that have happened. But unfortunately, you know, something that we need to take into account as we're trying to change with society. Yeah, so I I looked up just for this particular case, the... uh demographics for Adel, Iowa, which has grown a lot, by the way, in the last 10 years. And this is from the 2010 census. But at the time, Adel was 0.3% black uh, as of, you know, about 11 years ago now. So certainly, uh, again, I mentioned a county that is made up of either affluent suburbs of Des Moines, Iowa, which is already not the most culturally diverse city, um, combined with a more rural uh, county seat where the county courthouse is. I would imagine, Andy, your your predictions would be pretty fair um, as far as how it would have gone down. And and certainly, you know, physical testing is risky um, regardless, but anything we can do to make the industry more inclusive and to bring those different minds and different thoughts together, again, we've said over and over on the show, we'll, we'll make organizations more secure and make our country and our industry safer. So 
That's something we want to encourage as much as possible, but also just be cognizant of the risks involved in, in helping everyone um, do their job in a way that is safe and, and most effective for everyone. Um, you know, it's kind of sad to think about saying to someone, maybe this isn't the right career for you or the right path for you. We don't, we don't want that um, by any means. And so it's, it's a tough conversation to have, right. Of um, it shouldn't be that way, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge reality. Like I was saying with the word hacker, you know, same idea there is uh, we have to be um, realistic with where things sit today too. And, and so some of those things are just real big challenges to continue to address as an industry for sure. But these were, these are two really interesting cases. And I think, you know, highlight, um, I, I think as, as a, as an industry where we still have, you know, kind of bringing the, the common thread here as an industry, we have a, a real challenge and opportunity to educate the general populace on what we do and how we do our work. Right. Because understanding, and, and you don't have to know the nitty gritty details of, of like coordinated vulnerability disclosure, CVD and, and get somebody in on that, but just explain like, you know, you tell the person or the company where you found the security hole, what you found, and you don't say anything about it until they fix it because that way you protect everyone as much as possible. Having people have an understanding like how, how we secure software and networks and cloud services, there is definitely an opportunity to educate. And again, it's not like you need to teach somebody all the things of it, but I often use an analogy of cars. People don't have to know how an internal combustion engine works, but you pretty much to drive a car need to understand that you have to put oil in it and you have to put fuel in it. And there is going to be routine maintenance required on things like tires and brakes. You don't even have to know how disc brakes work, but you do have to know that they, they do go away over time and it's something you have to replace, right? There's like, just as, as being a responsible user of this product, there is a minimum level of knowledge you must have in order to effectively use it. Technology and computers are no different. You don't have to know what an IP address is, but there are some base level of understanding you need to build. And I think that is something as an industry, we haven't always done a good job on and not everything needs to be a car analogy, but I think that one actually kind of works where there is that accepted understanding of a minimum level of knowledge to operate a vehicle. There should be that minimum level of knowledge to operate a computer. And that is I think truly an opportunity here because you look at how the Missouri governor spoke, how the Dallas County Sheriff responded, uh, all, all of these different examples, how the prosecutors might bring a criminal complaint against this journalist. Uh, there is still tremendous opportunity to up our game in terms of uh, uh, technology literacy here as a whole, or even think of um, – Gosh, there have been some some high profile court cases recently where there's been like wholesale misunderstanding or, or outright lies on how technology works. And boy, that's another conversation for another time. But there were major arguments in, say, like the uh, Kenosha shooter case um, over how Apple phones handle like zooming in on a photo. And there was this statement made that they insert data where there is none. And that's not how that works, you know as an example. So um, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but this, this just reminds me a lot of this conversation ultimately comes back to like layman's not having a solid understanding of how security research happens and how we actually protect uh, our, our digital assets. And that's again, an opportunity for the industry to uh, educate and, and improve that. So the next time there's a physical pen test, the next time there's a security vulnerability disclosed uh, correctly, that as opposed to the reaction being a negative response and somebody is arrested or threatened with criminal complaint, um, instead they are respected and honored for the work they're doing to help protect everyone. And I think that's the opportunity here that these stories really bring to bear. That's a great summary, Adam. <laughs> Thanks for listening as always and watching our stream. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, so we'll talk to you guys next week.
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.